The last type of U.S. government security that we need to talk about is called a TIPS. It's a Treasury Inflation Protected Security. They're fairly popular because of the concern that there could be inflation in the economy. So how one of these works is it has a nominal yield. Let's say its interest payment is 4%. And it has a par value of $1,000, just like we talked about with the corporate bond. So that the first year, this Treasury Inflation Protected Security pays annual interest of $40. But what happens with this bond is that it has an adjustment for inflation. So the test question might say that over the first year, inflation was 5%. So if inflation was 5%, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take the par value times inflation. So we have inflation of $50. so that we have an adjusted par value. So the Treasury Inflation Protected Security adjusts the par value to take into consideration inflation in the economy. The coupon rate never changes. It's always, in this case, it would be 4% in my example. What does change, however, is the interest payment because you take 4%, we started off 4% of par, but now we have to adjust the par value for inflation in the economy. So now we have an adjusted par value. So 4% of an adjusted principal amount means that your interest payments change over time. So that this coupon for the second year isn't $40, it's more than $40. The other thing to note, so we know that the 4% didn't change, but the principal amount does change. Thus, the interest payment changes because the principal has changed. When the bond reaches maturity, you are guaranteed at minimum to get back par value but it is possible if there's been inflation during your holding period that you will get paid back more than par value. So they're fairly popular type of U.S. government securities, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, TIPS. So they're really, U.S. government securities on a risk spectrum are the safest securities that you could buy. And then to buy something that has an inflation adjustment is even safer, if you will. So the safest of the safe. Granted, generally speaking, their nominal yield is going to be less than what you would get on a U.S. government bond. Taxes. There's always questions on taxes. There's a saying here that I'm going to teach you that will help us when we have questions about taxes. And it goes like this. So we've got municipal securities. Munis are issued by the state or lower taxing authority. And then we have U.S. government securities. U.S. government securities. The rule goes like this. They tax themselves, but not each other. They tax themselves, but not each other. What? <laughs> what is this talking about? So it's important to notice what we are talking about here is the interest on these debt instruments. The interest is taxable on a municipal bond. Taxable. They tax themselves. So it's issued by the state. It's taxable at the state level. They tax themselves. The interest on a U.S. government security, they tax themselves, is taxable at the federal level. So when you do your federal tax return. When you buy a municipal bond, the interest is tax-free where? Federally. 
tax-free federally. They tax themselves, but not each other. So a municipal bond is only suitable for an investor that's in a high tax bracket. I cannot stress that enough. There's going to be these questions as far as suitability goes. And sometimes, sometimes my students want to pick an answer that's municipal bond. The only time you will ever pick the answer of municipal bond is if it says something in the test question about the client being in a high tax bracket. Because the interest on a municipal bond is federally income tax free, it means that municipal bonds are only suitable for investors in high tax brackets. And we'll practice some suitability questions along in the course as we, as we go, but just don't ever pick muni bonds unless it says something about a high tax bracket. So municipal bonds interest is tax free federally. U.S. government bonds interest is tax free at the state level, which is really not such a big deal. So it helps us to remember they tax themselves but not each other. If you have a capital gain on a municipal bond, the capital gain itself is always taxable, both at the state and the federal level. Capital gains are never tax-free. We could hope, but capital gains are always taxable. There's one more thing, however, about a municipal bond that this test does want you to understand. So you have a client who lives in Colorado and your client buys a muni bond that was issued in Arizona. So the rule that we just discussed would be true. The interest on this municipal bond that was issued in Arizona is tax-free where? Tax-free federally, but the interest is taxable at the state level. So a common question I get from students is what state? Well, let me ask you, the client lives in Colorado, where do they file their state income tax return? In Colorado. So the interest on the municipal bond that was purchased from out of state is taxable interest on the Colorado tax return. Now, interest on a bond is taxable at ordinary income rates. Interest on any type of bond is taxable at ordinary income rates. But let's change this a little bit. Let's say that this same client, instead of buying municipal bond that was issued in Arizona, buys a municipal bond that was issued in the same state in which they live in. Now what happens here is that this client is going to have the interest double exempt. To encourage the wealthy to keep the money in the state, we give them an exemption as far as not only is the interest tax-free federally, but when they keep the money in the same state that they live in, the interest is tax-free at the state level as well. That is a concept that I do expect you to need to know on the test. So when the municipal bond is issued in the same state that your client lives in, the interest is double exempt. It is tax-free at the federal level and tax-free at the state level. Mortgage-backed agency securities. There are different agencies of the U.S. government. There's Ginnie Mae, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, those three all buy mortgages. We've heard a lot about them in the news over the past few years. And then there's Sally Mae, which buys student loans. Historically and legally, the only one of those three that buys mortgages that is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government is Ginny Mae. So, Ginnie Mae, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, they all buy mortgages and they pool them together and then they sell bonds that are backed by those mortgages. 
And of course, because of all of the foreclosures that the economy has had, there's been huge problems for these agencies. The only one of these agencies that the U.S. government is obligated to step in to help is Ginnie Mae. Ginnie Mae is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. It's like the government's favorite daughter, Ginnie. Although, if you've been following what's happened, it is true that the U.S. government has helped the other daughters, too. Oh, and the son, as the case may be. So on the test, if they were to ask you which one is fully backed by the U.S. government, I still want you to go with Ginnie Mae. These are pass-through securities. They pay principal and interest to the bondholders monthly. There's been a lot of problems with them. Generally speaking, they've been on the safer side of things. They were at one point as safe, uh, next to as safe as a U.S. government issue. So they're going to have more risk than they have had historically, but they're still on the safe side of a risk spectrum. You do need to know that the interest paid by agency issues is fully taxable, both at the federal level and at the state level. So pass-through securities, mortgage-backed agency issues. They have higher yields than marketable securities that are direct obligations of the U.S. government. We talked about the zero coupon already. We said that it is a U.S. government bond that has been stripped, separately trading the registered interest and principal. We said zero coupon bonds have no coupon, thus their title, zero coupon. They have the highest duration. Their market price is most volatile as interest rates change. There's something that the IRS does to zero coupons, however, that's not very nice. Even though as the zero coupon bondholder, you don't get back your principal until maturity, the IRS taxes you on the accrued interest every year until maturity. So you don't actually have to pay much when the bond does reach maturity because you're paying taxes on money you don't have yet every year as it accrues. That made them fairly unpopular. Municipal bonds. Municipal bonds are issued by the state or lower taxing authority. And there are two types of municipal bonds. Remind me, who are you going to sell municipal bonds to? Investors in what kind of a tax bracket? High tax bracket. Yes. There's GO bonds. These are called general obligation bonds. They're used to build things like schools, general obligation bonds. They're backed by the taxing authority of the issuer. Another way of saying that is they're backed by the full faith and credit of the issuer. General obligation bonds backed by taxes. The other type of municipal bond is a revenue bond. Revenue bonds are riskier than general obligation bonds. They're backed by user fees. So they build a toll road with the issuance of revenue bonds, and then they pay off those bondholders by collecting the toll. So revenue bonds have higher risk than general obligation bonds. Thus, revenue bonds have higher yields than general obligation bonds. So two types of municipal bonds both of them are best for investors that are in high tax brackets. We need to discuss a little bit more about that, about why they're good for investors in high tax brackets. So let's say the test question gives you two choices. There's a corporate bond that you could get for your client that has a 10% nominal yield, or you could get for your client a muni bond. And this muni bond has a 7% nominal yield. And the question is, which one would you recommend for your client? Which one? You can't answer that yet, can you? You're missing a key piece of information. They need to tell you, which they will in the test question, I promise, what is your client's tax bracket? So, for example, let's say your client is in a 25% tax bracket. If we have a corporate bond with a nominal yield of 
25% of that income is going to go to the IRS because they're in a 25% tax bracket. And the corporate bonds interest is taxable federally. So if we were to be asked, what is this corporate bonds after tax yield? After tax yield. The easiest way to do it is to take the 10% nominal yield and we're going to, well, let's think about it. How much of the 10% do we get to keep? All of it? No. 25% of it? No, that's what we owe in taxes. So 100% minus the tax bracket owed is how much of it we get to keep. So it's called the complement of the tax bracket. So 10% times 100% minus 25% gives you 0.075. If you were using your calculator along here with me. So 7.5%. Now which one's better? In this situation, if the investor's in a 25% tax bracket, the corporate bond is better. Both the corporate bond and the muni bond are going to be subject to state income taxes, so that's a wash. We don't worry about that at all. So if you could have an after-tax yield on the corporate bond of 7.5 or a muni bond yield of 7, the corporate bond is better for your client. Let's do another one. Let's say that the tax bracket is 35%. If the tax bracket is 35%, we have a corporate bond with a nominal yield of 10%. How much of that 10% does your client get to keep? All of it? No. 35% of it? No, how about 65%? 100 minus 35% is 65%. So we are left with an after-tax yield on this corporate bond of 6.5%. Now which one's better? See how the higher the tax bracket is? By the time we got high enough, all of a sudden, the municipal bond wins. It has a better yield for the client, but it's a function of what is the client's tax bracket. So in this case, the municipal bond wins. What would the bond need to yield to be equal? What would the bond need to yield to be equal? So if we have a municipal bond with a 7% nominal yield and a corporate bond would have to yield when the investor is in a 30% tax bracket, what would it have to yield to be equal? You should be able to do this because of the other examples that we just did. So what we're doing here is a formula called the corporate bonds equivalent yield. And there is math that goes with it. Generally speaking, you have, of course, four choices. You can eyeball them and subtract out the interest, and you can backwards do the math in case you forget this formula. But I am going to teach you the formula. We're going to take the municipal bonds yield, and we're going to divide it by 100% minus the tax bracket. So 7% divided by 0.70 because the tax bracket's 30%, says that if the client is in a 30% tax bracket, a corporate bond with a 10% yield is equal to, this is the corporate bond's equivalent yield, so that these two are equal. They're the same. Neither one is better. Sometimes it's nice to just prove it to yourself. Students, when they're newer, like to do the whole math. So if the corporate bond is yielding 10%, that means you get annual interest of $100. How much would you owe in taxes if you were in a 30% tax rate? You'd owe $30, which means you get to keep $70. And when you have a municipal bond with a 7% yield, it means your interest payment is $70 and they are equal. So a potential math question here, but much more important that you understand the concepts that you understand the concepts.
The money market is where very liquid instruments trade. So cash, as close to cash as you could get. So it's always important that you make sure that your client has an emergency savings account set up before you suggest that they buy securities. And then the money market instruments are, are securities that are suitable when your client has a short-term need. For example, maybe they would like to buy a house in the next two years. Don't sell them growth stocks. That would be unsuitable. But money market instruments would be suitable here. So the bulk of the money market is comprised of treasury bills. I've said that already. So T-bills make up the bulk of the money market. All money market instruments trade at a discount. So T-bills mature in 4 weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, and 52 weeks. We also have bankers' acceptances that trade in the money market. These are letters of credit used in the import-export business. They trade at a discount. Commercial paper is a money market instrument. Commercial paper is issued by a corporation when they have a short-term cash flow crisis. Maybe the government contract hasn't paid timely and they have payroll that they have to pay. So they issue commercial paper. Commercial paper is sold at a discount. It has a maximum maturity of nine months. Corporations issue commercial paper. Banks issue negotiable CDs. So be careful between the concept of what we mentioned earlier, which was a bank CD. That's something that you can buy from the bank teller. It's not a security at all. A negotiable CD is a security. It is a money market instrument. It's what banks issue to institutional clients when banks need to borrow money. They're sold at a discount from face value. They have very high face values, like a million dollars. So banks issue negotiable CDs to institutional clients. They are securities. Treasury bills, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, negotiable CDs. All of these are securities. They are exempt securities, which means that no registration is required. We will talk in more detail about the concept of exempt securities in the law portion of the course. Bank CDs are not securities at all. Bank CDs have liquidity risk because once you put your money into a CD, you tie it up for however long you've agreed to. So three months or six months or a year or three years or five years, they have all different sorts of maturities. They're sold by the bank tellers themselves. They are not securities products at all. They have liquidity risk which I mentioned, they also have reinvestment risk. Anytime you tie up your money, when it gets paid back to you, you have reinvestment risk. It is important to know that the money that you have at the bank is insured by the FDIC. So a bank CD would be insured by the FDIC. The coverage of the FDIC, it is insurance, is $250,000 per depositor per insured bank. So this is insurance in case the bank where your money is goes broke. The FDIC coverage is totally separate from what we call SIPIC, which is the Securities Investor Protection Corporation. SIPIC covers broker-dealers. So SIPIC does not cover the deposits that you have at the bank. So the bank CD, your checking account, your savings account, your what we call insured deposits at the bank, those are covered by the FDIC. Your money market mutual fund is not covered by the FDIC. It is not. So if your broker-dealer goes broke and you have a cash account and securities that your broker-dealer has that are yours and they go broke, you do have coverage by the SIPC, SIPIC, Securities Investor Protection Corporation. Demand deposits. Deposits at the bank we generally call demand deposits, meaning that you can walk into the bank and demand your $200,000 now in cash. Give it to me all. So demand deposits may be drawn upon upon demand without prior notice to the bank. So checking accounts, savings accounts are types of demand deposits. 
There is a negotiable order of withdrawal account. There are money market deposit accounts and time deposits such as bank CDs. These are all covered by the FDIC. Recently, this concept has appeared on the exam. The difference between a money market mutual fund, which is not covered by the FDIC, and the fact that at the bank you can have a savings account that's called a money market account. That there are certain rules about how often you can access the cash in a money market account at the bank. Are money market accounts covered by the FDIC? Yes, money market mutual funds are not, but the money market account that you maintain at the bank is covered by the FDIC. Determining the value of equity securities. We have previously done a discussion about there are different analysts that exist out there. The two broad camps are fundamental, And then there's quantitative. This is technical. Fundamental financials. Qualitative. I always think of the quality of the financials. I hope that they're prepared with quality, but they're not trying to hide something in there. So fundamental analysis and technical analysis, quantitative analysis. Which one of these two would read the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flow, would be concerned with the P.E. ratio, price book ratio, there's even a price sales ratio. Who looks at all of those things? The current ratio, the quick ratio, the debt to equity ratio, the fundamental analyst. If you're going to make some charts and graphs, if you're going to look at the price of the stock over time and you find it looks like this, this is called a head and shoulders top formation, then you're a technical analyst. Head and shoulders top formation shows a stock that is in currently in a bearish position, a stock that is currently going down, a head and shoulders top formation. The head and shoulders bottom formation, okay, pretend I can draw because it's definitely hard for me. Head and shoulders bottom formation shows a stock that is in a bullish position. So the bottom formation shows a stock that's going up. So these are things that technical analysts quants, we sometimes call them. They like to plot the price of the stock over time. They care about the volume of shares traded. When the price is the lowest, when the price gets down here, this is the floor. This is called support. So if you're a knowledgeable investor, when the price gets down low enough, what are you going to do? You're going to buy. I can't tell you how many times in a class of students I say that and people say they're going to sell. No, the odd lot investor, when the price goes down, they're the ones that sell. We're going to be what we call contrarians and we're going to do the right thing because the rest of the people out there don't know what they're doing. So when it gets down to support, that's when people start to buy, as smart people at least, start to buy, which drives the price back up. So the lowest the price has been over time is called support. The highest the price has been over time is called resistance. Resistance. So it's generally true when the markets start to close at all-time highs, this resistance, this ceiling has been reached, that people start to take their profits and sell the securities. So the selling of their securities drives the price back down, just like the buying of the securities drives the price up. So support and resistance. These are tools used by technical analysts. If you were to plot the price over time and it was just to be kind of going sideways, not really looking like a head and shoulders top or bottom formation, we call this a consolidation pattern. Consolidation pattern. When the price is just going sideways, it's consolidating. There's not variability. It's just moving sideways. 
two other strategies that technical analysts use. The bottom-up approach is when a quantitative analyst focuses on the actual company itself, not on the industry. It's a microeconomic approach used by a technical analyst. The top-down approach is a macroeconomic approach, also used by a technical analyst, where they focus on the economy and financial markets as a whole from the top down. So bottom-up, top-down, both used by technical analysts. If you were to plot a stock's 200-day moving average, you'd also be a quantitative analyst. Plotting a moving average allows the analyst to see changes in a trend easier than just plotting the stock price over time. So moving averages are used to show changes in a trend. We've already discussed how net present value can help us determine whether or not an investment is suitable for a client. So I won't go through that whole discussion again. We talked about how to do that already. So it's your job as an investment advisor representative to make recommendations to your client. So this chapter talks about all of the different things that you can recommend to the client. You can recommend stocks, you can recommend bonds. We've talked about options. We talked about futures a little bit. You can also recommend that their insurance needs are met. So in a test question, is it more important for you to suggest that your client pay off their debt or that their insurance needs are met? it's much more important that their insurance needs are met. It is your job as this expert in financial services to make sure you just, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, to make sure that in the event that they should die tomorrow, it, it, my son, he's, when he was 10, so this was a little while ago, lost his best friend's mom. So his best friend's mom passed away. She had had her wisdom teeth taken out. And three weeks later, had gotten an infection and passed away. She had three kids, and she was in her early 30s. Someone had sold them life insurance. It made the biggest difference. It doesn't make up for the terrible loss that that family has gone through. But there was some money there to help pay for the funeral, to set aside. The husband's still working all the time. So maybe it wasn't enough life insurance, but it was better than not having any at all. So that's what your job is. It's part of your job to make sure that in the event of this, you know, horrible situation, have they, have they purchased some life insurance? Have they set aside the most that they could into a retirement account? I can't tell you how many times people just don't sign up for retirement accounts. It's free money sometimes, meaning that if you put in, for example, 3%, your company will match 3%, and people just don't sign up. It's crazy. So that's your job. So they need to max out their retirement account. They need to have an emergency fund. They need to have some life insurance. Yes, it'd be great if they had no credit card debt, but that's really not your concern. Within insurance products, you might recommend that they purchase a variable annuity. So we need to see how do variable annuities fit into this whole entire discussion. What does a variable annuity bring to the table that maybe an open-end mutual fund did not? So if we were to look at a mutual fund versus an annuity product, versus a variable annuity. They're similar, but they have one key difference. So the variable annuity, you put money in, it goes in an after-tax dollars. The mutual fund, you put money in, and it goes in an after-tax dollars. While we're putting the money in, we talked about in the mutual fund discussion, you get a 1099, and that this 1099 tells you what your dividends were and what your capital gain distributions were. And you can either take those in cash or you can automatically reinvest them. In either case, no matter what, this was a taxable event. 
So taxable in the year of the distribution. Whereas if you have a variable annuity, it's similar to the mutual fund where the money goes into what we call the separate account of the insurance company. And it invests in the stock market. During the pay-in period, during what we call the accumulation period, when you're putting the money into the variable annuity, the earnings are tax-deferred. So if you were to ask a client how much in taxes do they want to pay, they're going to say none at all. Nobody wants to pay taxes. But we all have to pay taxes. So if you had two choices, one that creates a taxable event now and one that defers the taxes until later, this is the key difference between a mutual fund and a variable annuity. And the fact that the earnings during the pay-in are tax deferred is the best feature that a variable annuity has. It has other features as well, but the number one highlight of a variable annuity is during the pay-in, the earnings are tax deferred. So let's just make up an example. So you're 30 years old and you begin what we call the pay-in period. During the pay-in period, we are accumulating units. So we have accumulation units. This is the accumulation period. And it's very flexible when we're getting the money into this annuity product. You could pay a fixed premium. You could pay a flexible premium. You could pay a single premium. You could pay in more later than you thought you were going to or less later than you thought you were going to. It's an insurance product, yes, but it's not protection. The insurance company has no risk. Whereas if you were going to buy life insurance, you would have to pass a physical. Because if you were to die tomorrow then the life insurance company would have to pay the face amount to your beneficiary. So they want to underwrite you for life insurance and make sure that you're probably not going to die tomorrow. But with a variable annuity, because there is no protection, during this pay-in period, you have a beneficiary. There is a beneficiary. But alls are going to get if, you're, if you die during the pay-in period before you annuitize is the value of your account. So the insurance company has no risk. So if you've paid in, let's say you paid in a single premium of $200,000. This is in after-tax dollars. The $200,000 represents your cost basis. And if you were to die and the account was to be worth uh, 225000 the value of the account during pay-in would go to your beneficiary. So the insurance company doesn't have any risk. All they're going to do is pay out the value of your account. So during pay-in, there's always a beneficiary. The money goes into the insurance company's separate account, which has no guaranteed interest rate. It's a rate of return reflective of the stock market. Earnings are not taxable currently. We said earnings are tax deferred. Earnings are tax deferred. So they're taxable later. Now, you could choose to annuitize or you don't have to. To annuitize is to start the dollar amount monthly for life. So that is a feature of an annuity that is kind of cool. When you annuitize, the insurance company looks you up on their annuity table to determine how long they think you're going to live. So let's say that you annuitized when you were age 60, and they think that you're going to live to be 80. So they pay you your money until the time you should die. And if you outlive your money, you still get paid because an annuity pays you for life. After age 80, you get paid someone else's money. Cool. Sign me up. I remember when I was young, like in high school, when I first heard my dad tell this story, I thought to myself, I want one of those. Because my grandpa was 98 before he passed away. My other grandpa was 97. My great aunt is 97 now. My great grandma was 103. So I'm going to live forever. 
Don't tell the insurance company that, though, because they're going to look me up on the annuity table and think that I'm going to die at 80, but I'm going to get paid for life. So I'm betting I'm going to live. They're betting I'm going to die, right? That's how this works. So this idea that we have a variable annuity, variable annuity means there's no guaranteed interest rate. So what you earn varies. And when you annuitize a variable annuity, you get paid a variable dollar amount every month for your life, which is a variable period of time. Nobody knows how long it is that you're going to live for. All you know is when you annuitize, you get paid for life. So during pay-in, you always have a beneficiary. During payout, you may or you may not. It depends upon what annuity payout option you have selected. So if you think to yourself, this money is for me, my kids, they're all grown up, they've all got jobs, this is not for them. I want to get the most bang for my buck. You can choose a life annuity payout option that pays you for your life only. When you die, nobody gets the rest of the money. You will get the highest amount monthly by choosing a life only payout option. It has no beneficiary. So it depends really on how long you live. If I annuitized at age 60, I chose life income, and I died at 65, who gets the rest of my money? The insurance company does, and they use it to pay someone else. So that's how this works. So life income has the highest risk. If you don't want that much risk, you can choose life income with a period certain, which means that for a period of time you have a beneficiary, or you can choose to have a refund annuity. So if you had a refund annuity and you died any time in between age 60 and 80 in my example, so you died here when you were, let's say, 72, the balance of your money that has not been paid to you goes to your beneficiary, either in a lump sum or they can choose to get it paid to them monthly. So a refund annuity would have the least risk, thus it would have the lowest monthly payment.